It was a bit of a grueling two hours, and I do want to dive a little deeper into what you think the future holds here, but I am curious, as an attorney, how would you grade uh, former President Trump's argument versus Colorado's argument? Who do you think had the better argument there? I have to say, I think the advocacy was top drawer. Um, having argued myself in the Supreme Court and been thrust into that crucible, um, to be able to parry and respond and be responsive to the questions and still do justice to your overall theory without shooting yourself in the foot by making a concession or overextending the argument you need to make. I thought they both did an excellent job. Um, and they, they tried to um, stay within the lanes, if you will, of their briefs and their positions in the court below. And that at least, um, I, I'd have to give them both, uh, you know, a, a minus on their advocacy. And let's talk about hypothetical outcomes. First, let's say the Supreme Court does uphold Colorado's ruling. What is this precedent that this sets? What does this mean for other states? I can't imagine a ruling affirming the Colorado decision wouldn't be binding on every other state, even though other states have different procedures and rules that um, apply with respect to eligibility to be on the ballot as a matter of state law. Uh, I can't imagine they would set themselves up for a series of 12 more cases, you know, from Maine and Michigan and Minnesota. Uh, and, and try to deal with that in the context of a, of a time frame between the primaries and the convention and the fall election. So my guess is they will issue, on whatever basis they do, a dispositive ruling that would bind other states. And I know that you called the oral arguments a little dense, two hours listening to them. Is there any indication that you found on how the court will rule? I think, number one, I think what appealed across the board was this notion that you can't allow one state to make this decision, which would tell me it would be reversed on that ground, um, which would put everything back in play to allow Trump to be on the ballot in Colorado. Um, you know, an, affirm, an affirmance of the, um, I mean, the other, the other thing I should say, there was some pretty robust examination. I think it was by Justice Barrett and maybe Justice Gorsuch on whether the Colorado procedure was enough to conclude that President Trump had engaged in an insurrection. That is, what was the um, trial, if you will, that was had sufficient to establish the, the necessary predicates for the amendment, um, given that um, a lot of the reliance was on a congressional report, which is subject to the hearsay rule, which wasn't subject to cross-examination, which wasn't subject to the rules of evidence, um, and a sociology professor who testified about what the meaning of insurrection was at the time of the adoption of the amendment, and, and what quote, due process might be uh, required at, at, a, at a greater level than what was accorded in Colorado in a case like this. So there was some um, discussion of that, although that, that would require the court to dig much deeper into the issue of who's an insurrectionist and what is engaging in me. And that's, you know, that's going to be a more fact-intensive examination which the court may not be comfortable getting into, given that they have a fully developed record. It may be insufficient as a matter of law, but I don't think they're going to get into a factual finding one way or the other on those, given what the Colorado court found. So, so that's another takeaway for me.